The favorite leading man of star Betty Davis was born George Brendan Nolan in Ballinasloe, County Galway, Ireland, although his place of birth has been variously given as County Roscommon and Shannon Bridge, County Offaly. Try and hear his Irish brogue in the movies today, and you will hear only a British accent. He was the youngest of five children, born to shopkeeper John J. Nolan and Mary McGinnis Nolan, who lived on Main Street in Ballinasloe. His parents separated and then died, making him an orphan at the age of 11. From 1915, he and his sister Kathleen lived with maternal relatives in New York until he was old enough to earn money, likely traveling there together via ship. No white privilege here. To make ends meet, he briefly became a sheep herder and even crossed the Atlantic to find work in the gold fields of South Africa. George eventually returned to Ireland to study at the University of Dublin. By 1921, he had become, despite his paternal ancestor's service in the British Army, a dispatch courier for the Irish Republican Army guerrilla leader Michael Collins during the Troubles. At this time, he was hunted by the Black and Tans with a bounty on his head. George had developed an interest in acting and, partly to cover up his nightly activities for Sinn Féin, joined the Abbey Theatre Players. The Irish theatre scene was a hotbed of nationalism, with W.B. Yeats writing plays. You can learn more about Yeats and his friendship with Oscar Wilde on this channel. According to various sources, George actually acted as a doppelganger for the leader of the Irish Rebellion, Michael Collins. George allegedly led the British authorities on a wild goose chase, leaving Collins free to do what he needed. Collins was tragically shot in the neck, killed in an ambush in Cork in 1922. According to Volume 2, Issue 4 of Ballinasloe Low Life, published in 2012, the Irish War of Independence from England, careers of three different men named George Nolan, Brent the actor and two others, one from County Dublin and the other from County Offaly, were apparently conflated, which may explain some of the discrepancies regarding George's year of birth, life, and activities during the 1919 to 1922 to period. George will be referred to as George and Brent in this video. The American public remains very uneducated on the Easter Uprising, despite how important it is a purely nationalist movement toppling a government dealing heavily in myths and symbolism. Brent loved Ireland enough to return to it during the 1920s, during its troubles, which is something sorely lacking today as the southern U.S. border is overrun. In Ireland, in a display of ethnic replacement, Ireland's Croke Stadium has been taken over by Islamic prayer. Back in the 1920s, tipped off by a double agent to his imminent arrest by British soldiers, Brent went into hiding and later skipped town. His return to acting was necessitated by the need for a sustainable source of income of something he had proven he could do. By August 1921, he returned to the United States via Canada. In New York, he toured with the hit play Abbey's Irish Rose, which critics loathed but audiences loved, and then with stock companies in Colorado, Florida, and Massachusetts, appearing in the ensemble cast of The Nightingale on Broadway in 1927. Another three years on, George co-starred with Alice Brady and Clark Gable in the short-lived play Love, Honor, and Betray. Abby's Irish Rose was made into a film in 1927, perhaps cluing Brent into the Hollywood scene. He worked in Hollywood starting in 1930, initially playing farmers, doctors, and partner to Rin Tin Tin in The Lightning Warrior, before Warner Brothers recognized his potential as a handsome leading man for some of their more temperamental female stars. In 1931, Warner Brothers signed him on. Just one year later, Brent proved the studio right when he played Barbara Stanwyck's leading man in the not-so-subtly-named film So Big. 
This film got Brent noticed by Hollywood executives in a big way. Not only was he attractive, he worked incredibly well with female leads they considered difficult. Stanwyck fell for him. In 1932, Ruth Chatterton, one of the biggest stars of the time, saw a screen test that Brent made. She was immediately taken by his acting, and requested he play across her as the romantic lead in The Rich Are Always With Us. Brent accepted her request, but he had no clue what he was in for with his future lover Betty Davis on the 1932 set. Things between Brent and Chatterton went very well. As the New York Times put it, Brent's dark good looks, sophisticated air, and studious attention to his craft made him a solid, dependable performer. Brent and Chatterton's relations were so good that he co-starred in another film with her called The Crash. That was the second of four films he made with the actress, whom he eventually married. They divorced after just two years. Brent's talent, combined with his status as husband to Ruth, the first lady of the screen, Chatterton, meant Warner Brothers treated him much better. The studio signed him on for a long-term contract and eventually paid him a weekly four-figure salary. In 1932, Brent starred in a film called The Purchase Price. During one scene, his character and the character played by his co-star, Lyle Talbot, get into a fight. The director told Brent and Talbot to not hold back. Wellman wanted a real fight. Brent, ever the zealous actor, agreed. And he sent Talbot through the wall, right into a nail that was protruding from it. Talbot began bleeding profusely from his skull and was sent straight to the studio's infirmary for stitches. Luckily for Brent, Talbot recovered. Unluckily for Brent, the movie's reviews were pretty mixed. The studio he worked for, and thus his career, was in trouble. In 1933, Brent took on a role in the film 42nd Street, a bombastic musical. Warner Brothers worked Brent and the rest of the cast hard. The shooting schedule ran for 28 days, and the pressure was on to make this film work for Warner Brothers or face the closure of the studio. The end result was a smash hit film still watched today. Thanks to the efforts of Brent and the cast and crew, 42nd Street rocked the box office, bringing back $2.3 million on a budget of around $350,000. For context, this is almost $46 million profit in today's money. With that success under his belt, Brent had more power to pick and choose the movies he wanted to work on. In October 1933, the newly revitalized Warner Brothers gave Brent and Chatterton roles in the film Mandalay. The power couple turned down the assignment. Chatterton didn't want the role. As for Brent himself, he didn't want to travel so far for work. Was he worried about being captured by British forces? In October 1934, after a little over a year and a half of marriage, Brent and Chatterton filed for divorce. Brent always wanted the newest things, from yachts to houses. According to friends, he had a habit of eternally seeking an ideal. The name of the actress who Brent managed to charm next was Constance Worth, an Australian performer who eventually made it big in Hollywood. Perhaps they bonded over Brent's time in Australia. Brent and Worth's romance burned hot and fast. Their courtship was only six weeks long. In May 1937, they officially married in Mexico. While the courts quickly granted Brent and Worth their divorce that same year, Brent was not content. Instead, he sought an annulment of the marriage, possibly so he could avoid splitting his fortune with his now ex-wife. The court trial in August 1937 was highly publicized. Brent's ex-wife broke down in tears. The court ruled his marriage was 100% legal to Worth, which allowed Worth to successfully sue for divorce. He braced himself to lose a whole lot of money, but Brent's ex-wife's pride saved him. She was too proud to accept money from a man who didn't want her. In 1940, Brent got down on one knee and proposed to Betty Davis, begging for her hand in marriage after their on-screen chemistry in Jezebel. Davis, in a twist that broke Brent's heart, refused. She married Arthur Farnsworth later that year. Despite their year-long affair on and off set, Davis had fallen for someone else. Farnsworth mysteriously died in 1943. Did Brent have anything to do with it? 
Can you imagine the New Englander and the Irishman together? Their distance was apparent in The Great Lie of 1941, which lacks the magic of their earlier films. Honeymoon for Three marked Brent's first movie where he played across Anne Sheridan, a rising actress who also worked for Warner. Brent fell hard for the hard-working young redhead, and by 1942 the two married. According to many of Brent's friends, Brent was a horrible match for Sheridan. As one put it, George is a guy who has had his fill of the good things of life, and he's pretty bored with it all. Anne is just getting into her stride, she's having her first taste of fame, and being a normal girl she finds it thrilling. That marriage won't work out, believe me. At the time, Brent was living in a small bachelor pad at Toluca Lake, while Sheridan lived on a ranch in Encino. Brent's Toluca Lake property sold for $4.7 million in 2018. The tree-filled five-acre lot centers on an elegant two-story estate that covers 9,400 square feet. Through the front door, a formal entry boasts custom molding. Interior highlights include an indoor-outdoor living room, wood-paneled office, and billiards room under vaulted ceilings. A fireplace set into a brick wall anchors the great room, and wood-beamed ceilings draw the eyes upward. In the master suite, three sets of French doors open to one of two balconies. A tub in the bathroom sits under a subway tile backsplash. There are seven bedrooms and seven bathrooms in the home. Outside, covered lounges surround three sides of a swimming pool. A brick fireplace, lawn, and mature landscaping complete the backyard scene. After their marriage, Brent and Sheridan had every intention of moving in together in a bigger home, but that plan thr fell through with World War II. Building a new home became nigh impossible for the two due to labor costs, and so many dead Americans that should have been working and living in the American market. The lack of a shared home became the first of many obstacles that marred the Brent-Sheridan relationship. Brent's shyness was another, which Sheridan described as out of this world. Sheridan loved socializing with friends and other Hollywood celebs. Brent hated it. Brent, thanks to his friendship with Greta Garbo, was a health nut and insisted on having full control over his wife's diet. Sheridan, who had very little interest in food, grated at this. Eventually, this led to a blowout between the two over a dish of carrots. In 1942, Brent sat his wife down with a list of everything he hated about her. She was too much of a career girl, he said. Brent and Sheridan initially agreed on issuing a joint statement regarding their divorce to the press, but Sheridan didn't realize that Brent was about to betray her. He got to the press first. The next morning, Brent jumped on the phone and called the newspapers, saying the divorce is the last thing in the world I wanted, but I don't see what I can do about it. As World War II wore on, Brent put his career on hold and enlisted as a pilot. They rejected his application due to his age. Instead, he became a flight instructor with the Civilian Pilot Training Program. Even there, though, his relationship with Sheridan continued to follow him, with one recruit asking Brent for a picture of Anne Sheridan, even though they were divorced in 1943. A specialist in dapper, sophisticated gentleman, Brent gave reliable support to Greta Garbo, Hedy Lamarr, Barbara Stanwyck, and Betty Davis, with whom he appeared in 11 films. However, he was rarely described as dynamic. In his own words, all a good leading man needed was a good view of the shot of the back of his head. On the other hand, he was able to accumulate six marriages among his wives and other Warner Brothers star. He appeared with Myrna Loy in The Rains Came of 1939, and you can learn more about Loy on this channel. When lead roles became scarce, he appeared against type as the maniacal murderer in The Spiral Staircase of 1946, which is seemingly based on Henry James' novel The Turn of the Screw. You can learn more about James' buddy Edith Wharton in her video on this channel. Following that, there were several B-movies on both sides of the Atlantic, after which Brent retired from acting to concentrate on breeding racehorses. His archetype, the dapper gentleman, the old world sophisticate, was rapidly being pushed out of Hollywood by the likes of parts for neurotic young men. A similar change occurred to fellow actor William Powell, who you can learn about on this channel. 
Brent died of emphysema in 1979, aged 75. He married five times, supposedly, first to one of his female co-stars on stage, Helen, Helen Louise Campbell, in 1925. They divorced in 1927. She outlived Brent by one year, dying in Baltimore in 1980. They married around the mid-1920s just as Brent was experiencing his first taste of fame. Campbell was 10 years his senior, but that didn't stop their whirlwind romance. They separated after just six months, but Brent didn't attain a divorce until 1927. Ruth Chatterton was married to Brent from 1932 to 1934. Constance Worth was married and divorced to Brent in the same year, 1937. Anne Sheridan was born married to Brent in 1942, and they divorced in 1943, and finally Janet Michaels, his longest marriage. They were married in 1947, and she died in 1974. Chatterton's first divorce was finalized on August 12, 1932. The following day, August 13, Chatterton married George Brent, her The Riches Are Always With Us, and The Crash co-star in Harrison, New York. She was 12 years his senior. His final marriage to Janet Michaels, a former model and dress designer, lasted 27 years until her death. They had two children together, and this was a very successful relationship. A daughter, Suzanne, was born in August 1950, and a son, Barry, was born November 26, 1954. His fifth and longest lasting wife had died of cancer 10 years before his death. He lived alone in a three bedroom tract house with a Belgian dog named Skipper. He had very little money, emphysema, and he was stooped with arthritis. His daily schedule was as follows. Boil an egg in the morning, read a San Diego paper, drive the ancient Cadillac to a nearby restaurant at 4 p.m. for a small steak and tea home by five, perhaps to chat with friend Milburn Stone, who played Doc in Gunsmoke, or to receive a note from the reclusive James Cagney, a lifelong buddy. Brent, in his heyday, swaggered about several of his ranches raising cane and thoroughbreds and living like the star he was in Coldwater Canyon, where stars are supposed to live. Ruth Chatterton described him as surly, moody, unreasonable, and disagreeable. His daughter, Suzanne, is a writer. Her website states, I was born in the summer of 1950 in Santa Monica, California, into a colorful celebrity family. My father, Irish-born, was film actor George Brent, well known for his movies with Betty Davis. My mother, Janet Michael, was born and raised in San Francisco, California. She was of Scottish descent, a popular socialite and fashion designer. My brother Barry arrived in 1954, and we lived our early childhood years in the San Fernando Valley on a thoroughbred horse ranch called Royal Oaks Farm. As our father began to reduce his acting and became more active in breeding and racing horses, we moved to Rancho Santa Fe, California. Here I became active in the world of showing horses. As my teenage years arrived, our family traveled extensively in Europe where I ended up living and going to school in LaSalle, Switzerland. I thrived in Europe, falling in love with its diverse history and classic style. On my 16th birthday, we arrived at our new home in Dublin, Ireland, and I went into school in Waterford. This mystical country of our father's birthplace provided a charmed time, almost a step back in time with a big scoop of Downton Abbey overtones. It left a footprint on my heart and turned me into an incurable romantic. It opened the door into my metaphysical studies from astrology, numerology, past lives, and the fascinating mysteries of other cultures. But most of all, I knew then and there I wanted to be a writer. So here I am, living back in La Jolla, California, so many years later as the door opens for me to return to my love of storytelling. My wish and hope is to bring some fun and adventure into your everyday lives with my written words. After all, a little escape into the pages of a book is like a little sugar for the soul. I hope you will enjoy the written journeys ahead with my imagination in print. <laughs>